Hello and welcome to this session. In this session, we would be discussing about data mining technique, which is part of uh, supervised learning, and that is decision tree. So we'll be learning about decision tree, which is part of your uh, machine learning, right? Supervised, basically. Let us move on and discuss more about this. So in today's session, which is scheduled for one hour, we would be discussing about the classic banking challenge. You guys might have already guessed that. If you have not done that, we'll try to do it right. Fraud, basically, right? Fraud detection within bank. If I give you a loan, what is the chance that you might default on the loan kind of, right? What are the solutions available? Do we need to use decision tree only? Or can we use any other solution if I'm given such a problem, such a challenge of detecting the fraud within the banking sector? Right? Giving a credit card, lending a loan might be a tricky situation, right? What if the person whom I'm going to give loan or credit card, what if he is going to default? Yeah, bank is going to incur huge losses. So that's the typical challenge that we have. What are the various solutions that we have in order to address this so a problem? And why do we need to use decision tree? Why not some other technique, right? And uh, we are going to evaluate decision tree against a few other techniques which can most probably use in this kind of a situation and then we are going to discuss briefly about the decision tree methodology. We'll look into the theory of decision tree methodology and then we are going to run the same thing on R. R is a tool which is, you know, doing a lot of buzz and a lot of rounds in the statistical or analytical world. So we'll execute the same case study theoretically on R and see how we have to basically build a model around that. So that's the classical situation. Credit card, debit card, opening a balance, loan account. Someone might open an account in my bank. What if he's a terrorist? What if he's trying to save or uh, save black money in my bank? Right. I need to be aware of all those things. Nowadays regulatory norms are so strict that if you say that, hey, I didn't know that this person was a terrorist, it doesn't save you from taking a dent on your brand image, right? So a bank wants to classify its future customers into two categories. Is a particular customer risky customer for me? And do I need to reject loan for him? Or is this customer a good customer? And it's based on few customers' available attributes. Let's say you have a customer XYZ, he has the following attributes. He's an undergrad, he's married, he has a taxable income of so much dollars, the city population is so much, he has a work experience of 14 years, he's not from an urban area, he's probably from a rural region there. How do you categorize him as a risky customer or as a good customer? We need to identify this. So what are we trying to do here? We are trying to categorize the person, right? We have two categories, so we are trying to categorize. Even before we proceed with this case study, let me ask you this. If I get an email to my Gmail or Yahoo or whatever mailbox I have, how does your email classify itself into a spam email or not spam. Spam means it should go and sit in the spam folder. If it's not spam, probably it will reside in my inbox. How does that happen, right? Think about that. Think about this situation. There is a new... Yeah, absolutely, Manish. It's based on machine learning, right? An email for you might go to spam, 
the same email might come to my inbox. Not just that you are seeing, not just the number of users the mail was sent to. It depends on various other parameters. For example, if you're a frequent traveler, probably for you, if there is an email related to travel promotion, it makes sense. But for me, probably I'm not interested in any of the travels, so I'll select that email and click on spam. Now my machine or algorithm, algorithm is going to learn and it's going to decide whenever a new email triggers on whether it has to classify that email as spam or not. Learning. My algorithm learns. Each time I click an email, uh, select an email and click on spam, it's going to learn that. From next time, this kind of email, put it in spam. Kind of. right. So, here are a few more case studies even before we proceed with the banking case study. Right? A manager has to decide whether he should hire more human resources or not. Should I hire or should I not hire? That's a problem. We need to crack that. You cannot go by a gut feel and say, hey, let me hire. Let me try if that works. Otherwise, I'm going to fire them. Labor laws are not so easy. Right, if you're hiring and firing someone, no one is going to sit idle, right? There'll be a lot of cases filed against you. How, how do you avoid the labor union strikes and things like that? If you're going to hire, it's going to be a very costly affair. What if you're planning to hire five data scientists, for example? It's going to cost you a lot of amount, right? So you'll have to be very data-oriented in order to take such a decision. An individual has to make a decision such as whether or not to undertake a capital project or must choose between two competing ventures. That's another example. So what are the solutions available? This is basically a classification problem. I'm trying to classify, that is I'm going to segregate. Say I'm putting all these things in a in a small basket and giving to you. What would you do? You're going to differentiate everything. You're going to classify everything. These are my fruits, these are my vegetables, these are my meat, whatever we bring. What techniques are you going to use here? We can either use decision trees, knife base, classifier, K means K and N basically, sorry, not K means. K means is part of your clustering technique, part of unsupervised learning, right? Here we have KNN, K nearest neighbors. Support vector machine, SVM can also be used. So and many other things are there. But primarily let us look into these four and try to see which one is going to best suit us. Here we are. So DD stands for decision tree, naive base, k nearest neighbors, and SPM. Do we have a question? Oh yeah, my logistic regression also can be used here. For the other folks, do not worry about logistic regression. That's a kind of prediction building uh, technique, basically model building technique. So. Look at this. We have yes against each and every statement which is made here. Those are the advantages of decision tree over, over the other models. The other models, will they not suit here? They might suit. But we are just explaining over the advantages. Each model or each technique has its own advantages and disadvantages. In real time, probably you'll end up using two or three techniques together to get a valid output there. But for our webinar discussion per se, let us restrict ourselves to decision tree and its advantages. The visualization of decision tree is going to be extremely simple, which you're going to learn even when we execute our code, our command. It's extremely easy to interpret and easy to explain to the executives. Even if you have non-programmers, right, who do not understand the programming concept or logic behind that, you can easily interpret things. D 
DT, which is decision tree, illustrates a variety of decisions. And also the impact of each decision if different decisions were to be taken. So you have two or three or five decisions to be taken, right? Which decision is going to impact your final outcome to what extent? That can be easily illustrated using decision tree. It's going to allow you to predict or classify or explain or describe whatever outcome you're trying to achieve. If it's a numerical variable, you try to predict. If it's categorical, probably you'll try to classify, right? It's not just going to give you only one scenario wherein it says, hey, this is the final classification, go ahead with that. No. It's going to give you or it will also help you determine what is the worst case, what is the best case, and what are the expected values for different such scenarios. And the good part about this is it can handle both numerical and also categorical data. If you have categorical data, it's called as classification problem. If you have numerical data, numbers, salaries, and things like that, it's called as prediction problem, basically. Even in data mining, you call numerical things as prediction, and you use regression mostly. All right, you have these four techniques now. Decision trees are white boxes. That means the acquired knowledge can be expressed in a readable form. If you run this model right, decision tree, everything is clearly visible. We will um, just hold on, right? We'll, we are going to do a practical experience or um, we're going to execute our code and we'll see practically how does it look like, right? While the other models are black boxes, that means you'll not be able to read what's happening internally, right, with the knowledge that you have acquired. In order to comprehend, it's going to be difficult. For example, right, in decision tree, you'll have these kind of classifiers, these kind of rules, such as if weather is nice and if wind is normal and the day is sunny, then go play. It's in a readable format, right? Very easy to read. That's a good part about decision tree. Now, look at this. It illustrates a variety of decisions, basically, and also the impact of each decision. That is what we have discussed, right? There is a manager. Either he can hire a permanent employee or he can outsource a piece of work. Again, it's classifying, right? two decisions. Either you go for a permanent employee or an uh, outsource a piece of work. What if I hire a new employee? And what is the success associated with that? There's a 50% chance that you're going to save $100. Is there also risk, a uh, negative risk associated with that? Yes. With 50%, there's a 50% probability that you might also fail. And what happens if you fail? You're going to lose $40,000. Right, look at this, another thing here. If you outsource a piece of work, there is a success and a failure associated with that, right? Either you can succeed or fail. Any decision that you take, either you succeed or fail, basically, right? There's a 50% chance that you can, you might succeed, and you might save $90. And there is a 50% chance that you might also fail. If you fail, you're going to lose $20. So here, I'm looking into probability multiplied by impact. Probability 50% multiplied by, in, by the impact is going to give me the value for success. Probability multiplied by impact. 50% failure multiplied by the impact is going to give me another value. If I subtract these two, I'll get the final outcome. This is called as expected monetary value. One minute, so let me, that's okay, fine, all right. So with each decision, you might either succeed or fail. So the values associated with the success and failure are listed down. You multiply probability by impact, 
for success probability by impact for failure, you multiply, right? And then you subtract these two to get the final outcome, expected monetary value. You multiply the probability by impact. Here also you multiply probability by impact. You subtract these two to get the final value, right? right? Which is $30 and $35 here. Which one is giving you more profits? Here, $35, right? So you'll go and outsource a piece of food. So your decision tree not just tells you or not just classifies, but also it's going to provide you with the details on what is the success and impact associated with each decision that you're taking, basically. Right? Now let us understand this more. So decision tree is a supervised rule-based classification. Okay, Manish has this question, these dollar figures, how they have been, yeah, it's notional, Manish, it's notional. If you have the subject matter expertise, you can decide, right? If I hire a person, how much salary do I need to pay him? If the project is a success, what is the benefit that I'm going to get? You do all those things. Based on that, you arrive at a number, impact. Yeah, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into that. All right. This decision tree is a supervised rule-based technique, basically. So you will have a flow chart in this way. And the topmost node here will be called as a root node. And the moment I classify it here, like sunny, rainy, overcast, I'm classifying, right, basically? It's based on classification rule. And these nodes are called as, uh, basically, internal nodes and you have the branches, these are all the branches and then finally you have the leaf node. The leaf node is also called as terminate node that's the last node, right? You cannot further classify that. Now the path that you take fr right from the root node to the leaf node is called as a classification rule. So one classification rule could be if it is sunny and the humidity is high, don't play. If it is sunny and if the humidity is normal, go play. If it's rainy, probably go play. I don't know what this outlook is. Um, if it's overcast and windy, probably you'll not play. If it's overcast and it's not windy, probably you might want to play. Now this attribute selection measures, right? What attribute should I measure? How do I split? All this is based on some um, greedy approach and entropy, which is out of scope from our discussion, right? If you get into this program full time, probably you'll learn about, not probably, you will learn about the finer nuances of that. So here we go. When this technique, decision making, is coupled with machine learning, right? Decision tree can be used for prediction purpose. If you're going to couple that with your machine learning concept. Because decision tree on its own is a different concept. Uh, stand alone, decision tree is a different concept. It can be used in your project management as a simple technique, right? To help you decide on which decision is better for you. Right? So look at this. Now we have come back to our previous algorithm. So this is the historical data that I have. If a person is undergraduate, married, taxable income, city population, he has so much of work experience, and if it's not in urban, probably he's a risky customer for me. And if he's going to fall into this category, probably he's a good person. So I look into the historical information, I see who are those people who are actually defaulted, who are the people who were paying the EMIs or who have repaid the loan without any challenges, without any default. Uh, things in a statement, right? So I have all those details here. So induction, that means I'm using this data to actually build a model. I use some learning algorithm. I learn the model. Once the model is built, I can apply that model to new situations, new scenarios. Now a new customer comes to me and applies for a loan. I'm going to capture all these details from that particular customer. I'm simply going to put in this already built decision tree and get a solution 
on whether this person can be categorized as risky or good, the new person. And let's get into not extremely finer nuances, but at least let us know how a model works, right? So now don't ask me a question on, you know, why do you select undergraduate as your root node? Why can't they select marital status? Why can't they select this? Why can't I select city population? Why can't I select work experience or any other category there or any other variable there as my root node? Just because it's the first column doesn't mean you'll use that. Right? So that is when, uh, this is where, you know, an algorithm called as greedy approach and entropy values and information gain comes into picture. Manish, if you do not have historical data, then there's no chance of classifying anything, right? Then probably you'll do some experiment, some survey to get the data, or you can probably go with unsupervised learning and look into some kind of clustering, right? But in order to do this, you need to have some data. If you do not have, go get it. Do some survey, do some experiment quickly, and you know, you're good to go. All right. So I'm first classifying using undergrad. If I look into only undergrad, right, I'll see four good and three risky there. Basically, seven entries. Here I have two, and here I have five. So is a person undergraduate, yes or no? That's the first classification problem that I have. No. So all entries related to no are listed down here. Is a person undergraduate? All the entries related to yes is listed down here. So if I go to this model, right, I have two yes, yes and yes. So the rows associated to yes would come in here. And the rows associated to no would go there. Now I've classified. I'm going to stop the classification if I see that the category is the same. My intention is to categorize into similar groups. So here I have risky and risky. So I'm going to stop there if two categories are the same. Here I have good and also I have risky. So I'll try to further classify this particular branch. How do I do that? Right, this is also called as pure subset because there's no other way of classifying this. My final outcome is category, basically, right? to classify a person as risky or good. So here I have risky and good combination, so I'm going to further split that. The second split here is taking marital status. Why marital status? Why not taxable income something? Uh, you look into information gain and things like that. Which split is going to give me more information, basically? Right? All right, you're classifying a single and divorced. Uh, you have three entries for single, and you have two entries for divorced. So you write down the corresponding columns, the uh, rows there. And here, are you going to further split this? Guys, are you going to further split this? Divorced? Based on taxable income or city population, do I need to further split that? No, absolutely no, because that's a pure data set. But Nitish, Nitish, Nitish says that the pure subset can also be decided on the basis of marital status rather than category. Absolutely. Yeah. You can do that, maybe. Or maybe I did not understand your question properly, Nitish. Ah, okay, no, no, no Nitish. No, now I got it. So Nitish says that marital status is married and married, so you need not further split that. No. That's not the logic. The logic is looking into the outcome which you're interested in. The outcome which you're interested in the category, right Nitish? So you'll have to look into only category section. Yeah, Shashank. Right. Gyaneshwar says urban. What do you mean by urban there? 
So yeah, this single should be further classified using urban there. This need not be classified because you already have good and good there. If you have the same category, you're not going to further classify this. Here you have good and risky, two different categories, so you're going to further split that. Now you have further split that based on your taxable income, and you get two more pure data sets, pure subsets, right? That's it. So this is a simple classification. Now if I were to tell you on the classification rule, right, I would say undergraduate, no, marital status, divorce, job done. That's one rule. Undergraduate, marital, marital status, single, and less than 33,000. That's another rule. Undergraduate, no, marital status, single, taxable income greater than or equal to 33K. You have the third rule. So in this way, these are all your classification rules. Ah, Mayank, uh, so that's out of the scope of this webinar because time would not be sufficient, basically. We are already half an hour and uh, I have not even completed 50% there. We'll see in, at the end if I find. But that's not a concept which can be explained probably in 15, 20 minutes. It would take some sufficient time there. Sorry about that. So let's use our model now. Now here is a new data point which you got right a new person came to you and he has filled in the application with all these details now you are left with a challenge on whether you have to give him the loan or not approve his loan or not for that you need to first categorize this particular person so look at this this is a test data so you're first taking first one is he an undergraduate no so you'll take that route Marital status is what you're going to work into. Is he married or divorced? Divorced. So these two, it's a good, right? Classification, if I go back, undergraduate marital status, good. So that's a rule that you have established long back. So based on that, you're classifying the customer is good and probably you're going to lend him the loan or whatever be it, right? So now comes the hands-on session here. Even before that, do you have any doubts on just basics of that? Who sets the rules? You have got the rules, right, from the decision tree. That's an algorithm. This is an algorithm. Machine learns on its own, Manish. So first time, probably, if you have limited data, say you have only data point for 10 customers you're going to build this model and start using. Maybe the accuracy level is only 50%, maybe, right? But as and how you keep using that, right? As and how you keep predicting with the new customers, as and how your data set improves, increases, then you're going to further tweak your model. Right. Yasin, I'm going to explain you on R. Yes, absolutely, Paranjit. R is a new tool or new language on its own which is specialized in your statistics, data analytics. Yeah, it's similar to C, C++ or whatever technologies you can think about. But this process is to categorize data. How do you know data in category feels risky good without the model? You first build a model. Based on your data, you first build the model, right? Because based on your historical data, you might have already captured Santana, um, sorry, Shanta. You might have already got your historical data. You might have lent loan to 100 customers. Out of them, 70 have paid on time, 30 have defaulted. So you're going to class, you're going to record all the data of historical users. Thereby, you come to know what category people are going to classify, uh, be classified as, um, you know, defaulters, and what category falls under, you know, good customers kind of. How is it different than SAS or Hadoop? SAS is another statistical tool which competes with R, but R has 46% market share as compared to SAS, which has only 11.3% market share now, as of today. 
two years back, situation was different. SaaS was a market leader in statistics and analytics. But as of now, it's R. Hadoop is different. Hadoop is all about dealing with the big data. No, absolutely no, Shashank. I do not agree with you. R is free. SaaS programming is even more difficult in comparison to R. SaaS base is more difficult to learn because it has its own structure and things like that. R programming is pretty easy if you would have used that. Where do you have GUI base? You are speaking about E minor. You are speaking about EG and E minor, Shashank, right? What is the cost of that? License, single user, single desktop license costs you fortunes. I think the entire implementation would cost you five or six crores for a company. Why would a company spend five or six crores to get SaaS e minor, which cannot do everything which R does? SaaS has how many products? Close to 12, 13 products. So that's the chance. R is open source, Rahul. Uh, Manish has a question, I think. So then do we deploy decision trees in production with less data as it is expected to learn over time, meaning we are okay with errors? In absolutely. That's a call that you take. Oh, absolutely. Do you want to go by a gut feel, Manish, and then give a loan, or do you want to rely on some data that you have? What call do you take? Are you going to rely on some data that you have to take a decision, or are you going to go, your, go by your gut feel? Take a call. You're going to take a bigger dent on your brand image if you're going to go by a gut feel. So that is what you're telling me. Don't use any model because you do not have anything. R can work with Hadoop. Absolutely, you can integrate with R. What if our analysis goes wrong? Might go wrong. We are not got to be 100% correct, but we want to make an effort to take the route of database decisions, Jatin. What was that, Paramjit? You have typed in some junk, I believe. All right. And R is for structured data. No, Ishwar, R deals heavily. R deals heavily with unstructured data. Ishwar says, do we have slide for, no, we do not have that in this session. How is big data different than data science? Big data is all about data coming in from your videos, YouTube, from your mobile phone conversations, audio files, from the images that you post on your WhatsApp or something, right? And it's based on the data coming in from your Wi-Fi logs, from your GPS systems and all that, along with your social media textual information, right? That's big data. Big data is data which your traditional systems cannot handle. Data science is all about building these kind of prediction models. Our work, um, can our work on very large data sets is a question raised by Mayank. R is limited in memory, the system memory that you have. Say you are using 4 GB RAM, it's limited to 4 GB RAM. But nowadays GPUs are coming in. I'll not spend a lot of time on that. GPUs, which will help your R handle larger data sets. Uh, Jatin says effort is wasted, but if you're not building model, what are you losing there? I mean, it's cost-benefit analysis basically, right? GPU is like CPU basically, right? GPUs are like CPU session, and it's much faster, smaller chips, smaller size, things like that. Uh, one second. There we have. Let me see whether I can answer that, Shishank. Uh, graphics processing units. Yep, uh, let me go back to our 
are also. Here is R. Am I in the wrong webinar? I'm a web developer has R programming. Absolutely, Ravi. Just do a Google search on what kind of opportunities are awaiting a data scientist, what are the salaries that they're drawing, and things like that. You'll take back your word and say that, hey, this is a good webinar that I'm attending. Yeah. Do R have any global? No. R is open source. It does not have any global certification. All right. I think uh, you guys have exhausted of your questions, right? Let us actually run this and try to simulate the same learning that we have done on R. This is your R, R Studio, basically, right? Um, is there a question for me? How to get recognized in the market from our piece? If you probably undergo these kind of certification programs, Yasi, that in itself is going to induce some confidence in the interviewers. Point number one. Point number two, choose a course which is very robust in nature. Do not choose a training program from some institute which covers only the basics without the case studies, without the project and all that, right? If you look into Edureka, it's well structured. You have the theory, you have the case studies, you have the assignments, you have everything in that. Manish, there is no single institute, right? There is no single institute or there is no one global certification for data science. Each university has its own, right? Each training institute has its own. So the one thing that's going to differentiate you from joining something would be probably the course curriculum. Just go to the course curriculum and see whether that's in line with uh, the job descriptions which are posted on various websites, job portals, right? That's going to give you some sense. Uh, what are the good books to learn R? Janeshwar, R is an ocean and there is no single book. You can do data mining with R for decision tree, right? Data, mi data mining with R, that's the book that I would recommend. For overseas job, they demand for certification, most important things and so on. Absolutely, but if you have a certification and if you could not answer anything, are they going to take you, Yasin? That's a point that you have to ask. And the second thing is, Edureka also provides you with the certification, right? Why not go take that route? What is programming language used for R? R, Ravi, R has its own programming language. I'm going to show you now. Yeah, yeah, Gnanesh for data mining using R. Okay, here we go. We're going to read this data set. I'm not going to explain you the code which is used in R. Rather, I would spend more time in clarifying your doubts. So let us run this first line, right? What this first line is doing is it's reading this file fraudcheck.csv. Now I have this fraudcheck.csv data set. Where is it? Here it is. So someone was asking me on what, how does your initial data look like, right? Before you build the model. Before even you build the model, you will have few details available. My Excel is crazy because it has bunch of uh, different plugins installed. I have Node Excel, I have Excel Miner, I have Crystal Ball and all that. So just bear with me while it opens up. Comma separated value, that's an Excel thing. Yasi, dot CSV stands for. What exactly is our job as a data scientist? Jatin, so you'll end up building these kind of prediction models, Jatin, basically. You'll be predicting the future sales. You'll be predicting the future rainfall, probably if you're in weather department, right? You'll be predicting on which product will get sold to a great extent for retail customer. If you go to Amazon and search for a product, it's going to recommend another product for you. So how does that prediction happen? How does Amazon recommend you a particular product? All these are possible. Uh, business analyst. I would say, Shashank, at least two months of practice. Two months of undisturbed 
you know attention towards these programs is is going to put you in a pretty good position to crack an interview difference between data scientists and business analysts is a question Yasin is asking data scientist is a person who is going to play with the numbers crunch the numbers build the prediction models make company more profitable less risky and things like that business analyst is a person who is going to gather the requirements I'm not speaking about business analytics I'm speaking about business analysts basically um, would mere DS course help? DS means Manish, data science. All right. Yeah, it's going to help you. What more is needed on top of this? You need to learn statistics. You need to learn forecasting. You need to learn data visualization, and you need to learn um, data mining techniques. If that is why Manish, you'll have to be cautious on selecting a course. Look into the course curriculum, look into the job descriptions of the various web portals. That's going to give you a ballpark figure or some kind of a sense on what courses you have, you'll have to learn. What are the tools and languages to be learned to become a data scientist is what Jatin says. Jatin says statistical analysis, forecasting, data mining, and data visualization. These are the four things that I would recommend from my end. How do you differentiate between data science and predictive analytics? Predictive analytics is a part of data science, Ishwar. Business analytics and DS are similar. Yes, Yasin, they both are similar. Once you do something with the data, you will have to come up with a business inference out of that. Any data analysis that you're going to perform should help your business, basically. That is your business analytics. There are some free courses offered in Coursera will help and it's going to help you. Shashank, it's going to help you. All right. So here is the data set which we have undergraduate details, marital status, taxable income, city population, work experience, and then urban yes or no. Right. Now this is the data set that I have which I've uploaded to R. I'm attaching the data set for my use. I'm reading the header. When I say header right, it's going to give me the first six cells of this particular Excel sheet, right? which are 600 rows and six variables, six columns. 600 out of six, right? Um, so out of these 600 observations or rows, the first six are displayed here. Then you can do a quick summary and check. This is called as descriptive statistics, right? You first describe the data set, try to see how the data set is going to look like and things like that. So in undergraduate, I have yes or no. 288 places, I have no. And 312 places, I have yes. Marital status, I have, for this factor, I have three levels, divorced, married, and single. I have the count against each of those. These two are your categorical data. This is your continuous data, income. Hence, you have minimum value, maximum value. You have taken the mean, median, first quarter, and third quarter. First quarter is right, uh, bottom 25%. Third quarter is from the minimum value till third quarter, you'll have 75% of the data. Are you sure? Yeah in memory basically it stores there locally for some time guys hope you are able to hear me all right yeah now uh, let us do this I'm going to classify the people who have taxable income less than or equal to 30,000 as risky and the people who have greater than 30,000 as good, just for our understanding, just for this case study purpose. In reality, within the data set itself, you're going to have whether a person is risky or good customer, right? Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to merge this new column which I've created with the existing data set fraud. So you have six variables now here. If I run that command, I have seven observations there. That means the new column which I've created, which is called as uh, here, 
which is called as category got created and I've basically merged with the existing table there. Now if you look into the table right you'll see that for category what is this doing customer dollar category from the customer data set I'm selecting category which is a variable now let me run this command so what did I just do or let me look into names and then it'll become easier for you so okay okay now what I've done is I have deleted the third column so look into this. You have undergraduate, first column, second column is marital status, third column is taxable income. That got deleted and that got, anyways, you have category, right? Income less than 30,000, you are going to term him as risky. Greater than 30,000 as good. So that category is anyways there now. All right, now, C is equal to two mins. I'm going to restrict my sample I'm going to say that hey generate the same sample each time kind of do not worry about that if you do not understand right now whenever I'm going to build a model I need to look into two things one is I need a training data set based on which I'm going to build a model right say out of 600 I'm going to say hey let me classify or segregate or divide this data set into two halves 50 percent each so the first 50 percent of the data I'm going to use on training or building the model basically right look at the length of train it's 300 because I'm doing number of rows of customer divided by two and assign it to the training data set so the length of training is giving you 300 I'm assigning minus train to test that means whatever data set or whatever rows I've assigned to the training data set Apart from that, whatever is left out, whatever 300 is left out, I'm assigning it to the testing data set. And I'm looking, I'm going to look into the length of that, which is 300. So 300 for testing and 300 for training. Why am I doing this? Because once I build a model, I'm going to test whether that model is actually giving me good results or not. What is accuracy of that model, right? I'm going to test using this test data. So the training data set, we have the testing data set. Look at the names. I have all these things for testing data set. I'm going to classify something called as testing underscore high. I'm going to create uh, uh, check the length, which is 300 once again. I'm looking into the dimensions of training data set and testing data set. Right? Now, if you have noticed here, your testing underscore high has taken the category. It has taken all the categories from your uh, test data set, basically, right? So what does my test data set contain? 50% of the data from this whole data set. Out of that, I am just taking the category. You know what is category here? I'm just taking my good and risky details only this one column there and I'm assigning it to testing underscore high just for now remember that so I'm going to look into the summary of the training data set I come to know about the summary here briefly you need to look into how the data is distributed and things like that in order to run this decision tree you need to install a package called as tree now what is tree? Tree is a package or collection of code which people have already written in the past and that has been approved saying that hey you can reuse this code that's the beauty of R. There'll be, there are two million users working on R. Two million users. Say I'm a user I'm doing some work and I come up with an interesting code to accomplish a piece of work I can send that code to our core community who are going to package that code and give it a name and release it in the market for free. 
Do you need to rewrite the code each time? Not required. You can just use that, right? So look at this package free was built under our version this. So here, if this package is built, you need not install it once again. So it comes by default in your R. Now I'm, this is a command to run decision tree. tree. I'm running this decision tree on training data. And I want category. I want to predict the category whether the user is or whether the customer is a risky or a good customer. This till is going to tell why. Regressing on dot. Dot means and all the remaining variables there. So classify and tell me the category based on undergraduate, marital status, city population, work experience, and urban. That is what your dot means there. And I'm doing that on my training data set. Let me run that. Done. So let me plot that for you. Look at that. Nothing is visible here, right? On this plot. This is a decision tree that's created, but I want to know the attributes associated with that. Yeah, here we go. So this is how it has classified it. Second first city population. It's segregated that based on work experience. Uh, once again, based on work experience and city population and things like that. Right, and then you have various rules created. What is a rule? City population less than 58233. Yes, it goes to work experience. Is work experience less than 20? Yes. Is it less than 11.5? Yes. Then again, city population and again in that way, right? It's going to create your decision tree. Now, I'm predicting. Now, I've just built the model, built the decision tree. Now, I'm predicting it using that predict function, right? So, I'm trying to predict based on this model, tree model that I've built. And now, I want to do that prediction on the testing data. And I want the classification, so type is class. Don't worry about the code, my dear friends. It's not easy to learn in one hour, right? So here we have the dimensions of uh, training data set. Now, once I have done that, I want to look into what is the misclassification error. So we're on, when I run this model, it's 0 0.2333 something. This says that, right, your error is more. So for example, in reality, a person should have been a risky customer, but he has been classified as good. In reality, a person should have been good, but he is classified as risky. Uh, the higher this number, more is the classification error. Right. So that means your model that you have just built is not helping you achieve good results. What do I do if that is the case? You're going to prune the tree. Pruning means limiting, right? Say you have these many levels of split. Probably you're going to reduce these number of splits. Or probably you'll consider only one, one part of this. That's called as pruning. Where is this? So again, you're going to fix the sample size. And then you're going to, this command cb.tree is for cross-validation. And what are the names in that? Size, um, the, the method basically it's going to use, that, that is what it's speaking about. So when I cross-validate, right, when I do this, it's going to give me these dots. Now don't worry about this, I'm going to explain only about the interpretation. I, B means both both your dots and also your lines. So let me run that. Now look at this. From here until here, it's good. Then there is a sudden change. There's a, a steep bend there. Steep bend, right? At second position, there's a steep bend basically. So I'm going to use best equal to two because at the second position, I've seen that that there's. Uh, 
So I'm going to prune the set now. Do not worry about pruning and all that. I'm doing that. So once I prune, I come up with the plot. Now if you see for a fact, it has been condensed. Remember the earlier one, it had a lot of branches and things like that. Now you have reduced the branches. Right? Why did you do so? Because my graph here, the plot, cross-validation was telling me that, hey, take only two. And I've put two there. And now if you predict, and now if you look into your misclassification error, you're getting 0 0.22. So you are able to reduce it from 0 0.2333 something to 0 0.22. You can further do that. There are very advanced techniques available in decision tree, which is going to help you achieve your outcome. Right, so I have a few more examples post which I'm going to take your questions. So you can use your decision tree to find out tumor cells, right, cancer cells and all that. Uh, you'll be able to classify the credit card transaction as fraudulent transaction or not. If you're going to swipe a credit card somewhere, sometimes you tend to get a call from the call center saying that, sir, have you really made the payment or have you really initiated the transaction? Based on what are they going to decide? They obviously cannot call each and every customer and check whether the transaction is fraudulent or not because millions of transactions are going to happen at any single point of time. Right, categorizing the news articles as finance related articles, weather related articles. If people are posting on social media, left, right and center, how do you, you know, scrape through the entire data and classify as finance, weather, sports and things like that. Right, so you can do all that. Now I'm open for questions. Post the questions, I will request you to look into this. Right. Whenever you are making a future complex decision, you can use a decision tree. When you're just experimenting with the decisions, right? And if you want to evaluate the decision visually and look into its impact, you end up using decision tree. When you want to present your decision and its comparison with other decisions, then also you tend to use that. Do not forget, friends, at the end, once you close, you'll be shown the feedback, uh, survey feedback URL, please spare just few minutes, right? It will hardly take 15, 20 seconds. So just fill in the webinar uh, survey. Right? Thank you so much for attending. Even before that, let me take your questions now. Party package, Sneha? Did I use party package somewhere? Where did I use that? It's not party package, right? It's tree package, which we have installed. Or is your question something else, Sneha? Is your question, what is a package? Bhavik, yeah, I, I'm not sure. You'll have to check with Edurek. I'm just a trainer here. So you'll have to check with Edureka. Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. So Shanta has a question. With 15 years experience as senior project manager, what role should I have for in data science field? I have learned Hadoop, R, Analytics, Mahmood, Cassandra, and machine learning from Edureka. Oh, great. That sounds great. So, uh, Shanta, I will request you to look into the domain expertise that you have, right? 15 years experience is not a small experience and I'm sure you might have gained a lot of expertise in your, uh, over the 15 years in particular industry or sector or domain, right? You will have to look into that specific industry or domain and apply for a position wherein you lead a team of data scientists and guide them basically, right? That is a kind of position that I would rather look into if I were you. Uh, what is the threshold probability used in this tree code? The prior probabilities for target versus non-target is not one is to one, that is 50% each. 
I quite uh, I didn't get you Aditya on that question. What is the threshold probability? What do you mean by that? Between R and Python, what's in fashion or demand? R and Python are equally good now. I would say R. Ah, no, Aditya, default is not 50%. I've divided the data set into 50% training and 50% testing. I've just segregated in that way. Default is not 0.5 then. What are the onsite opportunities for data scientists? There are a plethora of opportunities. Just do a search. McKinsey, data scientist, job shortage, right? You'll see that. And whatever country you're trying to opt, right? Just go to your job portals, look into this keyword data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, business analytics, and things like that. You'll come to know on your what's the career prospect for business analytics? analytics and data science which has better future career. Both are the same. It's just like I can call you Muhammad or I can call you Yasin, right? Either way it's the same. It's just same name for two different things. Right? Mm, default is 0.5 to make decisions. I've answered that I believe. What are the type of questions asked in data? Ah, Shashank, that would be, I mean, depends on company, which company is interviewing you, which domain they are planning to take you. If Amazon interviews you, they ask a lot of questions related to retail, how do you build a recommendation engine, and association rules and things like that. If a banking customer or client or some company in the space of FSI is going to interview, probably they'll ask you questions around how to build a fraud detection model and things like that. So it's all specific to an industry there. Can you show the max of predicted probability across each class of the targeted variable? I didn't quite get you, Aditya, on that. You can drop me an email or to support at adureka.co, probably I'll be able to help you with that. But just a little elaborate on what your question is there. Will doing a data scientist program in US be helpful? Absolutely. But doing a data scientist program, Jatin, there is going to cost you fortune. If you're going to get the same program for a lower cost here, why not opt this rather than opt that? Uh, Yasin, which sector case studies do we deal with while learning? I think there are a plethora of case studies uh, across the industry so that everyone benefits from the program. All right, friends. I think we have done a good job in able to complete the session within one hour and also address a few of the questions. Thank you so much for attending the session. Have a great day.